This is episode number 39, featuring artist Michael Godfrey. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. The Plein Air Podcast is all about the world of outdoor painting, called Plein Air Painting. For those of you who don't know, it's a French term that essentially means outside. The French say Plein Air, others say Plain Air, but it doesn't really matter how you say it. It's a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. This show is all about the movement, the painters, the collectors, the galleries, and the art. This week's podcast is brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, the largest gathering of Plein Air artists in history this April in San Diego. And you can learn more at Plein Air Convention. And this year we're doing something very cool. It's game show. Yes, we have a game show. And it's called Plein Air Wars, kind of like Cupcake Wars or something. A game show. We're going to have six artists, the men against the women. Each will have 30 minutes to do a painting out of their head on stage with their non-dominant hand. They can't use their correct hand. And they get a string of obtuse colors. It's going to be lots of fun and laughter and paint flying and people probably cheating and trying to mess everybody else up. And got a couple surprises in this. And the sponsors of this are Rosemary Brushes, uh, EZL from Artwork Essentials, the Easel, uh, Windsor Newton Paints, uh, Raymar Panels, and the Easel Brush Clip. You can learn more at plenairconvention.com. You need to go to this event. It's very cool. It's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting. You can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media. Uh, if you have any ideas, people you want me to interview, email me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. The interview is brought to you by the Plen Air Salon Art Competition. We're down to the wire. You've got to get your entry in. It's a chance to win $15,000 cash. This is the final chance to enter right before the big prize is announced. Get your entry in today. It doesn't have to be a painting from this year. It can be from any year. Put your best paintings in. Let's get right to our interview with Michael Godfrey. Well, we have Michael Godfrey on the line today. Michael, welcome. Hello, Mr. Rhodes. It's good to talk with you again. Michael, Mr. Rhodes is my grandfather. Call me Eric. <laughs> Will do. You know, I, I grew up in the South, and we say Mr., Sir, and Ma'am. Yeah, well, that's nice. That's a good thing, I guess. I should probably beat that into my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I am uh, absolutely in love with your work. I think you are one of the finest landscape painters in America. I don't say that lightly. Um, I just, um, you, you know, sometimes you see somebody who hits it once in a while, but it, it appears that you hit it every time. It's just maybe you're not showing us the dogs, but. You do a beautiful job. I wish that were true, Eric, but um, thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate so let's, that. let's talk about how this all began. Um, what are your first recollections of, of art? Arts. Let's see. I, uh, like most artists, grew up drawing comic books, that sort of thing. Always been interested in art. Where'd you grow up? Grew up in North Carolina. You said the South. Okay. Mm-hmm. North Carolina, Fayetteville, North Carolina. All right. Mm-hmm. And so you were, uh, you're just kind of drawing, and were you any good at that time, or were you just kind of like the rest of us? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I knew something was up in first grade. I think I, I, our first grade teacher had us draw a uh, portrait of ourselves on the first day of school. Yeah. And toward the end of the year, she had us draw another portrait of ourselves. And my first portrait just had that typical um, round circle for the head, no body, just, you know, eyes, nose, and mouth. <laughs> and um, my last portrait, I remember, had I had discovered I had shoulders and arms and and um, a body. And, uh, and, I, and I noticed mine was different from the rest of the kids. So I started thinking about it then, I think. A little bit. When you got a little encouragement and a little confidence? Yes, I did. You know, but but mm-hmm. I, I I remember uh, just really loving the um, times when we painted in class. We used to have she used to set up easels for the whole class, and um, 
and, and I remember just loving to paint my little blue strip across the top for the sky and a green strip down at the bottom for the grass. <laughs> well, it's essentially what you do now, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Big just shapes. Little... Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, how, how did you transition from first grade into becoming a full-time artist? Well, um, now I uh, had a seventh grade teacher who um, asked me one day, had I ever painted anything? And she, uh, and I told her no. And so she said, Mike, I'd like you to try some of my oil paints. So she brought her oil paints to school and she set me up an easel in the corner of the room and she had me paint during the day. And so I, I think I painted for the better part of a year every day. I had to do my make up my my um, schoolwork at home, but she really encouraged me to paint. And that was my first introduction to oil paint. So why is it that she saw that in you? Because if you weren't doing art, how, how did she have this sense that you had well, some, I, something special? Well, like I said, I, I was drawing all the time. So, so yes, I, I, up to that point, I was drawing, you know. And, and, and she saw that she 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 knew that I could draw and 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 things like that, but I did not paint until that point. So really, the recognition uh, and support of one individual really is what drove you in that direction. Well, I've had many, many people. God has put many, many people in my life and um and 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 and, and I have a lot of people to be thankful for. I, I had great teachers in in high school and great teachers in college and um and family M my wife has been a great inspiration to me and so I, I guess so god has put many people in my life to uh, assist me and push me forward and give me encouragement so did you have the sense that you um when, when you got out of high school that you were going to pursue art as a career or what, what when did that happen Yes, uh, I uh, went to art school, and I uh, uh, majored in design, and I uh, minored in painting. But uh, you know, while I was in while I was in college, I I painted some, but it was mostly you know in college you get an introduction to a lot of things. So I was printmaking and doing photography and all the things you do in art school. Uh, interesting, the design element of that. Well, um, you know, the, the design is still important to me. I I, I uh, design my I design my paintings even now. I think about the uh, the canvas as a page that must be designed, and so I think about all the elements of uh, of a painting. Well, I think that that's something that doesn't get talked about enough. So let's talk about it. Um, I, you know, I know it's tough in a in a verbal situation like this where we don't have a sketch pad to to refer to, but. Um, you know, people who really understand design make better paintings. Um, I think so too. And, and maybe that's maybe that's why your paintings are so spectacular. But are there some principles that you might be able to share with us that could perhaps be helpful? Yes. Uh, when I approach the uh, whatever format I'm working on. I'm, I'm looking at the bigger shapes and, 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 and what I want to do is design those, those shapes. The, those shapes are important to the whole painting as a whole. And so I, I must establish those big areas first. And so uh, I, I think, I, I think about the proportions of the light versus the dark and the midtones. Uh, that to me is the most important thing. And then the details can flow from there, even if, you know if there's if there's details at all. But, so uh, but I, I, I want you to go back through that again because I want to make sure I capture that. You said you think about the proportions of the light and the dark in the mid. So, yes. are you looking to accomplish a particular goal? If you go out on location and you see a scene, um, you're you're responding to that particular scene. But are you? Are you moving things around? What, what are you doing to kind of create that sense? And I assume you want a dominant shape and a and then a less dominant shape and so on. Is it like right. do you have a percentage that you try to hit, like a 50% or 80% of one particular shape and 
or is it all about balance? I'd, I'd like to understand that a little bit more. Well, you know, I, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in creating the best composition on the canvas that I'm painting, irregardless of what I'm looking at. And so if, if I need to have a tree mass that's larger, then it appears to me, I'll go ahead and do it because the final painting is the most important thing than, than uh, strictly copying what I'm, what I'm seeing. And so those masses are, are very, very important. And the, uh, I don't necessarily have a, um, a uh, formula. I don't necessarily have a, uh, a, um, a formula that I use, but I, I do know that I paint intuitively and I know when it feels right. And so I, uh, feel, I, I, I focus on the, uh, the design of the shapes first until I get the pleasing composition I want, and then I proceed with the painting. So when you're outdoors on location, um, you're laying in big shapes first. Do you do any kind of an underpainting? What's your process? I uh, usually try to tone the canvas down a little bit uh, with a neutral color. And then I uh, uh, generally um, l look at the um, the uh, big masses first. I, I normally will paint the darker masses first just to get the, the, the uh, combination uh, of light and dark. And then I proceed from there. Um, but let me tell you something about how I paint when I'm in location, is that I paint um, uh, parts of things. Uh, if I'm interested in a, in a tree mass, I'll focus on that tree mass a, a lot of times just to see if I can get nailed down the color and, 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 and the hue of things. Um, I'm not necessarily trying to finish a, make a finished painting when I'm on location, but what I'm trying to do is understand and, and, and that's what I find that I can make better um, I can make better studio paintings by understanding what I'm seeing in nature. Um, it, it's rare that I uh, go out to create a finished composition uh, when I'm out in the field. I'm more interested in, in nailing the exact color I see because th that sensitivity, it will make me a better painter. And so a lot of times I'm just out there really trying to um, uh, un understand how things are, are are shaped in nature and the coloration and the mood and light. So somebody listening to this right now is is going to be saying, well, Michael, why don't you just use a photograph? <laughs> well, the problem with that is, which I discovered a, a, a long time ago, is, is that um, a photograph will give you some information, but it will not give you the information you need to make a good painting. And and uh, now I, I use photographs in my work, I do, but what it does, it gives me a, a, um, a large amount of uh, extraneous detail. It gives me the general shape of things. But the problem with photographs is that uh, this is the physical process your eye can see millions of colors, whereas that photograph is distilling all that information down into four basic colors. And so uh, if you're painting strictly from photographs, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Um, to be a better painter, you must paint from life, whether you're painting still lifes or, or landscape or, or the human form. You, you must paint from life to uh, improve your work. If, if, if improvement of your work is what you want to do, desire to do, then you should paint from life whenever possible. It really sharpens your ability to uh, see, and uh, it's just indispensable to become better. You know, I've gotten to the point where I cannot start a painting from a photograph anymore. I, I physically fight the whole process of, of trying to do it. You know, once in a while you'll be driving mm -hmm. along in the car and you'll see something, and you'll grab your iPhone or something, and you'll snap a shot of it. But... I, you know, to remember it, but I find that if I don't have a study to work with, because I, I've gotten myself so spoiled with painting from life that I really fight the whole photographic thing. I'm not down on it. I just fight it. And uh, I will use a photograph as a reference to remember some details or something if I want to add them in, but I try to only use my studies um, up to the point where I need to add in some detail. Because what happens is the minute I pull the photograph in, I pull in the temptation of that dark is not really that dark. 
Uh, right. It's dark in the photograph. That the sky is not really that light. Um, right. You know, the the light on the the leaves of the the grapes is not as as uh, dull as it is there, or as bright as it is there. Exactly. So exactly. when you, when you go out and you do a study, I you're, are you kind of capturing a little bit of everything, or are you just kind of focusing on that tree mass? Um, well, the 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 thing about paying on location is that um, at, at different times I'll focus on different things, and and um, um, the, see when, when when I'm out there looking, I'm also taking mental notes of how things look and, and the coloration of things like that. Um, and the thing about when you're uh, painting from a photograph, you, you just strictly, you are, unless you have a great memory, then, then you're losing a lot of the, the subtle tones and shades of what your eye sees. And uh, it's, it's just not, uh, a, it's, it's just not a great way to work really, really. Right. So, where where does your inspiration come from? Uh, what is it that keeps you painting, keeps you from getting bored, keeps you interested? Well, you know, uh, Eric, everything is so beautiful, and there's so much to see. Uh, you know, creation is just endless, and this is a big, beautiful country we live in. <laughs> and so the way the way I I stay uh, inspired is that I really only paint the things that inspire me at the time. And uh, when I get tired of painting, uh, um, let's say, marsh scenes, I paint I paint mountainous scenes. And when I don't like painting that, I'll, I'll paint something else. What, what, what I paint is, is the thing that inspires me at that particular moment, and that always keeps it fresh. How much travel do you do? You're, you're a professional artist. You make your full living as an artist. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, what I try to do is take three to four big trips a year, which is which means I'm going out west or going up north somewhere. Uh, but but I take a lot of uh, local trips, day trips in the area. So how often do you go out plein air painting? I paint mostly during the spring, fall, and winter, uh -huh. and, I, and I try to go out at least once or twice in a week's period, as long as it's good weather, once or twice a week. What about summer? Summer, I find I'm just not as interested in, in summer uh, because it's just so green where we live. Yeah. And it's, it's just hard. It, I just don't have a lot of interest in, in what I see. Uh, now, I, I do uh, do it occasionally, but not as much. Not as much. Uh, I'll usually try to select a early morning situation or a late evening. Uh, but I don't paint as much during the summer. So do you know how to, how to tell the difference between uh, somebody who's been painting for a long time and somebody who's been relatively new to painting? How's that? You look at their greens. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, greens are a whole world unto themselves, you know? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I made a joke out of that, of course, but but um, it really is true. You know, when when... when uh, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's not universally true because there are people who, who break the rules and there are no rules, but you go out and you paint greens when you're relatively new at painting and you're painting what you see and they tend, not always, I mean, some painters manage to pull it off, but you know, if you paint what you see bright in intense sunlight hitting a green lawn, um, is kind of almost like a strip of cadmium yellow, right? <laughs> and or or cad orange, and oh. sometimes it's just a little bit too much. So, what is the trick that you use to make your greens more readable? Um, what I say is nature is dull, and so I try to dull my colors, and then if I need to bring it up, I will. I. I will uh, mix a uh, a gray with my colors to 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 make a uh, a, a tone. Well, you use or, a tube gray, or you just use a combination. Well, just a combination. Just make a gray, and and I make a black using a uh, a a blue or and a brown of some sort. Yeah. And I use that to dull my colors. What I try to do is dull 
initially paint very dull and then slowly, like a, like a conductor in an orchestra, slowly bring up what needs to be emphasized. And, uh, but what, what I try to do is, is, uh, and, and see that, and that comes from being out there and observing nature has lots of neutrals, uh, tones and tints of colors in, in our, our mind is, our mind remembers colors much more vivid than they actually are. But, uh, that, that's why I like going out there and painting because you can see that, man, it's, it's dull. <laughs> you know? Well, you ever painted in Florida in the sunlight? Uh, you know, I try to stay away from that. <laughs> a, few, a few times we've been down to the Caribbean, it was just impossible to paint. It's just too beautiful. It's too intense. And uh, my mind just can't get around it. I admire people who can do it. Well, it's tough. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the one thing I've said many times on this podcast and, and also on stage is that, you know, when I, when I started painting, I was painting, I was representing what I saw. And when I started painting, I was living in. Florida. And, you know, the, the greens were too garish and, and so on. But I didn't know that. I mean, it just did. But the paintings never looked right. And what finally made the transition for me was realizing that all the good paintings that I would see in the museums and all the good paintings I would see in the galleries were almost giant paintings of gray with little tiny highlighted touches of brilliant color, sometimes right. not even too brilliant, but they came alive because of those little touches. Right. Is that what you do? I do. I, and I mean, that's what I'm, that's my thinking uh, when I'm painting, yeah. you know, especially uh, um, when I'm on location, it's, it's just try to uh, be sensitive to what I'm actually seeing and, um, and, and keeping my colors muted as much as possible. Now, now you can look at my work and say, "Well, that's not muted," but uh, but that's my thinking. Okay, it doesn't always happen, but but that's what I'm thinking. How many paintings do you think you do a year? You know, Eric, it depends on how I'm working. This year, I've started doing larger paintings. Like uh, how, in, how large? Well, I've got a 24 by 48, huh. which is a sort of a medium size. Um. But I haven't done a lot of studies this year so far, so I'm, I'm not sure. It, it really, it, it all depends. It kind all of depends. ebbs and flows. It ebbs and flows, yeah. it certainly. Yeah. Oh, one, one thing I wanted to say earlier was that um, uh, I have maybe 85 to 90% of everything I've ever done plein air. You keep them. I keep them. I, I keep do, too. Reference. I keep them for reference. I, I, I have them also, when, when I need an idea... For something how something might have looked, I fish through my little small paintings and uh, pull it out. Yeah, I thought I was the only one. I'm glad to hear that. I I got talked out of one the other day. I was just kind of actually kind of irritated that I allowed myself to do it. <laughs> I, I had posted a a picture. I save all of my studies, all my plein air works, because to me they're my vacations, they're my visits to exotic places, and they're wonderful memories. And I can look at that painting and remember when that deer leaped across the grass in front of me and or, or whatever happened at that moment. And so I keep them. I don't ever sell them. And the, the, I made the mistake of putting a picture on Instagram. And this guy called me. He said, I want to own that painting. I said, it's not for sale. And he kept raising the price. And I finally said, oh, I guess I'll sell it. And, I, and you know, I'm glad he's happy about it, but I kind of wish I had it. And you know, so I'm glad I you're doing that. I, I, understand, I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, there is something different about... The, I have a different feeling about those plein air works than I do my studio work. I, I am closer to those for some reason, for the same reason that, that you, you say. It is the struggle out on location. And when I look at them, I remember every last aspect of it. And uh, you remember every brush stroke. And uh, they're, they are... They're special. There's something well, special about them. They're soulful and they're real. And, yep. um, you know, they're, they're reactions to your moment standing in front of that scene. Yes. And, and I seek those out. When I go to museums, I'm looking for studies. I love all paintings. Or, well, I don't love all paintings, but I love a lot of paintings. But I especially love the studies because, uh, you know, if you can find something that well, I, I, I saw recently, I was in London, and I saw the constable studies. Constable did this study of the trunk of a tree that 
I just couldn't believe. I mean, it was one of the most stunning paintings I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And then he, there was also a studio painting of that painting. It just, it was beautiful, but it didn't have the, the soul, the response. So I, I'm always looking for studies. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. There's something about that because you, you can see the, uh, you can see the struggle in the study. And uh, one thing I suggest to people when they, when they're out painting is to not necessarily try to do the finished painting but really just focus on one thing and, and just try to nail it down, you know? And, and, and that would be so much more useful to them years later if, if they keep their studies, you know? Well, a lot of people sell them, I understand that. But I, but, but I keep them to, um, to use at a later time. So you will keep, you, you'll pull out, if you're working on a studio piece, you'll pull out your studies and you'll start flipping through them and saying, okay, I need a waterfall Yes, or I sir. need a tree or I need a whatever. And you'll just, you'll take it from one of those studies. Yep. How oh, yep. cool. I, uh, I, I work small when I'm on location normally. Yeah. Uh, How small? Uh, six by six, five by seven. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's, I find that that's enough to, um, to, um, help me, you know, do what I do. Capture it, the it, scene. Yeah. Right. Right. So enough information. Well, also, it speeds up the process quite a bit, you know. It's, it some, certainly does. You know, you know when I'm out, I, I can I can uh, paint one in an hour, and, and I can really document the area that I am in and, and just document the light flow as it changes during the day. Yeah, that's fun. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll have to go painting one day. And we'll, we certainly will. And I, I, I promise I, I won't try to buy your study. <laughs> so... Um, you know, let's touch on on some educational aspects because you know a, a lot of people are discovering plein air painting. A lot mm-hmm. of people are discovering the plein air podcast. I think we're up to forty or fifty thousand listeners now, uh, which just blows me away. The technology, and and I constantly am hearing from people who are kind of entering things and they're trying to figure out how to how to learn what the best ways to learn are. I also hear from painters who are always trying to figure out how do they get to the next level. So first off, do you do any teaching? Uh, very little, just every once in a while I'll do a, a, a local workshop of some sort. Yeah. And so um, what are the kind of the most important principles that you want to try to get across to people? If, if you're teaching, what do you, if somebody wants to learn, how to paint, uh, how to be a plein air painter or a studio painter. What, you know, what do you tell them? Well, I tell them initially to uh, practice seeing, uh, practice drawing. I mean, you know, they have, you have to have some skill of, of you know, drawing, draftsmanship. Uh, but the whole is more important than the individual. A lot of people want to go immediately to detail. And, and I tell them that it's better to, to, uh, just look at masses and try to get accurate values. It's much more important than, than detail. And so, I mean, that's sort of a hard thing for them to, to see and understand. Initially. Well, everybody, everybody who wants, they, they all want to start with detail. Everybody wants to be the lead guitarist. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, they'll, uh, I mean, you know, an early stage painter will paint the tree in before they paint the background in. Right, 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 right. So, uh, you know, uh, mainly the composition and the values are more important to me. And, and so if you could, if you could get those things right, I think you're well on your way. You know, um, if, if you get the colors and, and the values right, um, you can build, you have something to build on. So what do you think is the, if, if I said to you, look, I have, um, I have a need to learn this fast. I want to ramp up. I have never painted before in my life. I want to ramp up fast. What's the, I, I'm not so sure that's a good idea, but let's assume it is. What's the the best possible way to learn this as rapidly as possible and still do a good job? Well, you know, Eric, um, I had a guitar teacher tell me that you got to practice every day. And to paint well, you've got to paint every day. And, and there's there's really no fast way. But if you want to get to wherever you are going to be in this successful, you have to put the time in. And so 
you know, you've got to get that first 400 paintings behind you. I, I, I think your 455th painting is where you're going to start rolling. Well, I better get busy then. I, I'm going to have to end this right now. I got to go paint. <laughs> no. 400. Well, it's probably accurate. I remember uh, Kevin Corder. It was one of the first plein air painters I ever met when I saw I, I saw him at an art show, a plein air show, the first one I'd ever seen. And he, his advice to me was go out and do 100 30-minute paintings uh, just to, you know, knock them out. Go, go fast, go for impulse. You're saying 400. Big difference. Well, everyone has that number. Yeah. Okay. Whether it's 400 or your 600 paint. I'm not okay? being critical. I just, I right, just right. think. Yeah. No, no, but, but, but it is, it is just a matter of being consistent with what you do over time. And that's the only way to do it. There are really no shortcuts. You have got to put the time in because I know that I sense improvement the more i paint the more i put the time in uh and, and I, don't, I don't think there's any there's any shortcut but but you know you, you can't get there faster but you're painting that means you're painting every day every hour you know do you lose it if you don't paint you know i think you do i took a i i took a little um i, I took a little time off um you know like, like around the holidays and um I come back rusty. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I um, a, a little diversion here. I, so we we had uh, Max Ginsburg come in for a video shoot to shoot the first. I think it was the first video we ever shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, Max said to me, he said, you know, I painted uh, every day for the last six days to get ready for this. Mm -hmm. And and my first reaction was, Max, you're Max Ginsburg. <laughs> you know, you don't need to do that. And he says, no, no, no. He says, if I, if I skip a day, I get a little bit rusty. Uh, right. If I skip five days, I get a, a lot rusty. And, and he said, you know, you, you, you got to just stay on top of it all the time. You're human. And, and, uh, the week before the plein air convention, I'm paying 40 hours a week. <laughs> oh, you're going to, you're going to really make sure you, you uh, do a good job on stage. Uh, yes, sir. Because you know, you know the. Um, you better because if you don't, you won't get invited back. <laughs> you know the, the, the thing about it is you can you can actually do a demo, and it could be a dead elephant, and so I don't want that to happen. So I want to do a good. <laughs> good well, job. the last time you came, you blew everybody out of the water. Did you paint forty I hours that week too? I don't know about that. I don't know about that, but but we'll see. But I, I'm definitely going to. Uh, you know, practice beforehand, you know, cause you just don't want to do that. You know, I, you know, I, th I think that's a really important lesson for everybody here. Um, it's not about winging it. It's about practicing. No, you know, about, I, yeah, I think really, that's a, that's a really great idea. And yeah. uh, that's very cool. I have a, um, my wife gets me going early in the morning. You know, she, she's, she's an early bird. So she gets me up and uh, I, I get up and get going. You guys have kids? <laughs> We have three daughters. Wow, what they're ages? Out, they're 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 out of the house almost now. I've got twenty eight, twenty four, and twenty one. Wow, almost. Yes. What's almost mean? Well, my last one, baby daughter, is a junior in college right now. So, oh, so she's living at home. She's at home. Ah, cool. So yeah, you're going to be an empty nester soon. She's on campus, but, uh, but yes, uh, I guess that's, that's down the road. Yes, sir. Oh, mm -hmm. she's on campus. Cool. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I know everybody's going to get really upset with me for diverting here, but you're a guitar player. Uh, well, I have a guitar and I play. <laughs> <laughs> I have a guitar. Yeah. Right. See, see, I, I know you're a guitar man also, but, uh, the thing about it is, uh, I have, uh, you know, with that, with that internet thing, you see who the guitar players are, and, yeah. and I have a guitar, okay? Yeah, I They're get that. You know, I play in between paintings. I have a guitar right here, and I play in between paintings. But uh, there are people who play guitar. They're the guitar people, okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, I totally understand that. I, I completely relate to it. I, and, 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 and that's where I was going to go with this, because I really wasn't going to go off on a guitar tangent completely. Although, you know, maybe I'll do a guitar podcast. That might be fun. Um, right. So... But I, but I keep a guitar. Um, I keep a guitar right. I have one right here next to my desk. I have one in my studio. I have one in the house. Yeah. 
Yes, and uh, so, and I keep them out because I know that if I don't keep them out, I won't play them. But I find it to be so valuable for my brain, right? So if I'm having a, a particularly stressful moment in business or I just, you know, I've lost my energy, I'll mm-hmm. pick up that guitar and just start playing with it. And, um, you know, it kind of brings me back, but it's been especially helpful for painting because, you know, you get stuck and you sit there and you suffer with, you know, trying to figure out how to solve a particular problem and it's just not coming to you. And when that happens, that's when I go to the guitar and I'll play that guitar for five or 10 minutes and then I'll go back to it. And it seems like it comes to me real quickly. Do you find that to be the case? Uh, Eric, I do the same thing. I have my guitar. Uh, I have about three guitars also and, and I have one and I, I grab it and look at a painting and play it and study the painting. And uh, I, I find that it kind of rejuvenates me, relaxes me, and, and, and just inspires my cre- creativity. So, well, it puts uh, your brain, it's start using different parts of your brain too. And so your, your brain is actually changing. So you're actually looking at the painting while you're playing. That's interesting. I'll yeah, try so that. And the uh, anything and, to try, if I could be as good as you, I would try that. <laughs> but it's a, uh, it's you know music and and the visual arts are very similar uh it's they go hand in hand um yeah i you, think i think richard schmidt plays the piano oh really okay I, I, that, he, he I once don't. told me he said i had to make a choice when i was i think he said when i was like 25 or 20 years old or something he said i had to make a choice it was either going to be a concert pianist or a master painter he said you can't do both you can't do both I agree with that totally. I I um, knew that when I went to college, I knew that I better just play the guitar a little bit and focus on my art because it it's, it occupies the same part of the brain, and you can't be great at both. I think. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's people out there who will prove us both wrong, but uh, that's certainly. True. As soon as you say that, you know it's going to happen. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I think I relate to that very much. Well, I'm going to get off of guitars because somebody will complain. <laughs> um, but you have to stay focused, though. You have to stay focused. So how have you managed to make a living as an artist? Uh, how, how did you get that? How did you convert that from being a guy who learned to paint to being a, a guy who actually made a living? Well, I, 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 I transitioned from from uh, commercial art to uh, fine art. You did? So, yes, sir. I, I was already um, I was already doing uh, design work. And so... Uh, so were you a, a graphic artist? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Both. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I, I design uh, publications and multimedia stuff. Wow, cool. Yep. Um, and was painting all along, all along but then just uh, transit slowly transition. So you slowly transitioned. You didn't just wake up one day yeah. and say, I'm going to chug this job. No, no, no. Uh, you, you know, I, I had family, you know, three kids, a wife, and, uh, and I had a bad habit of eating. So you had to get some uh, money to eat, you know, <laughs> terrible. habit. It is a terrible habit. So I, I worked at the uh, university of Maryland and designed publications and, and multimedia for them. And so, and, and, and is that your advice is that, you know, you want to transition, you want to, so I, I assume you probably started getting your work into galleries or trying to get into galleries and kind of waited till you had enough paintings that were selling until you pulled the trigger. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. That, that, yeah. I think that's the way that it probably should be done, you know, especially if you have a family. Yeah. I, I, um, found you well you have to be you have to be wise and, and, and my wife's a mba too so she had a little a little uh influence on those decisions you know yeah well that's good yeah that's fortunate mm-hmm. so can i ask you a sensitive question you may yeah so i'm disappointed that we don't have more diversity among painters um you know that's a tough one it's uh, it's not something that's necessarily uh, encouraged, you know. And um, it's uh, it's a situation where where uh, there's plenty of people with ability, 
but they don't necessarily see a path to get to where they want to go. And, uh, and, and I think they might give up at certain points. You know, well, I would like think I, you'd be a huge inspiration. I have tried to be, thank you. I've tried to be. Uh, uh, but like I said, you have to have good people around you to, to in, encourage you. Yeah. You have to have, you have, to have, to have opportunity. And, and there's always been people that have been in my life that have encouraged me and given me the opportunity. Yeah. And, and I, and I don't mean to bring this up and, and, and do, you know, have any, I, I don't know. I just, I, I don't want to be uncomfortable about it, but I, I was talking to Dean Mitchell about this, and this is one of the things that he's really trying to change. And, um, you know, I look across the sea of painters at the Plein Air Convention, and, you know, it's kind of um, lily white. Um, and, and it's, that's, yeah, I mean, it's great. I'm very happy for anybody who is willing to come, but I also feel as though, um, you know, we, we meaning me, um, we meaning you, we meaning our community, we can do more to embrace people and, and bring them in. You know, I have this whole thing called right. the Plein Air Force to try to get out and, and uh, bring more people into painting in general, mm-hmm. you know, take it out to schools and so on. But right. I wondered if there's something we're doing wrong that we need to do that, um, that will give people a, to, uh, an understanding that gee, here's another option. I can be a painting. I can make a living as a painter. Yeah, I, I think you have to actually see someone doing it to even get a vision for it. Um, I know early on, like I said, I've had people in my life, and, and I met some professional painters when I was in seventh, eighth grade. You know, So I, I, I could see that it's possible, You know, that, that it, it was possible at, at one time to do that. Um, but I've always had a drive to paint. I've always wanted to paint and create. You know, it, it was something that was just inside me. And, and so I looked for those those uh, those mentors and stuff and early on. Yeah. And, I, and in fact, I, I, I met Dean years ago, you know, and, and, and talked with him over the years. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, I, I think mostly you've just got to see a, a, um, a mentor and have a mentee relationship with people. Um you know, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've wondered myself. And, and then you've got to you have a situation where you've got to get your work shown. Um, and so exposure, that, that's a whole nother thing, too. Yeah. Marketing. Marketing. Yes, sir. As you well know. Yeah. I know a couple of things about that. <laughs> I, but I there's a lot of things I still don't understand, which I'm trying to learn. I'm I'm uh, constantly learning. Well, let's shift gears. You know, maybe maybe you and I need to sit down and have a beer and talk about that and try to figure out how we can how we can help people and and solve that problem because I think it would be a, a worthy mission. What do you like? Feel like you're the best at? The feel like, you know, I'm the. Uh, the this is going to be hard to swallow, but you know, I'm the I'm really really the world's best at, or I'm really really good at X. You know, is there something, some area that you really shine in more than other areas? Is there a type of painting that you you do better? I, you know, I know that I do my landscape paintings are a whole lot better than my portrait paintings, but there are <laughs> landscape things that I, you know, I really, really crush, and then there are others I really struggle with. Is there is does that happen to you? Oh, uh, let's see, Eric, I would say no. <laughs> Uh, so I'm weird. Okay, I get that. I, no, you're not weird. You're not weird. Um, you know, <laughs> I um, um, I'm inspired by what other painters do. Uh, my struggle against is against what I do, and I am still learning. It's still a journey. And and, I'm glad and, to hear and, that. And and there are things that people assume I know how to do, <laughs> but I am struggling every day. I I, I want to learn. And that's and, and that's what I, I try to do. I try to learn. I try to get better at this every day. Well, you're one of the world's great uh, landscape painters, I think. I don't I don't know. Do you do any figure or portrait work? Not really. You know, occasionally I'll I'll, I'll try to get my wife to pose for me. I'll paint her and I'll paint my kids occasionally, uh, just to break it up. Yeah. But I really love landscape painting. I've I've always loved landscape, and uh, I, I it goes back to my childhood being out in the in the uh, wild. Uh, painting, I mean, playing. And so uh, uh, 
it's it's just something that moves me. I'm really moved by, by by the light in nature. So, what's the place that you've always wanted to paint that you haven't had a chance to paint yet? Oh my goodness! Let's First see. thing that came to mind. Um, uh, let's see. My wife would say Hawaii, but I would say New Zealand. I think I, I I've seen some paintings from New Zealand of, of New Zealand of the mountains. Oh and the man! I and wish I I'd, I wish I'd have known. You know, I've taken a group of 50 people to New Zealand. Oh, uh, really? February 21st. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that is, um, that's on my bucket list anyway. I'm, I'm going to get there. Yeah. Well, I wish I'd have known. I would have, I would have uh, let you know about it earlier. Um, yeah, I've never painted there, been there, but I've never painted there. And I'm re- very excited about it. Um, yeah, cool. It looks fantastic. It looks fantastic. Oh. It's, it's amazing. And, and, and we're doing some really cool things. For instance, I've got this friend, his name is Richard Taylor. He's, I think he has more Academy Awards than anybody else. And he, um, he has this company called Weta Workshop, which is, they're the people who did Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and all this, all the stuff for Avatar. I think they do all the effects. They do all the, all the costumes and swords and things. So mm-hmm. we've got everybody a private tour of that when we're going over. Oh, so wow. It's going to wow. be fun. Uh, even though it's not related to painting, it is an art. That's definitely well, an art. Well, uh, I will tell you this, Eric. I study cinema as much as I study paintings. I love what artists do in the making of movies, how they light things, their choices of, of, of all the elements. And I think there's a lot to be to learn from those type of artists. You know, it's interesting you should say that. I, I, I wouldn't say that I study it, but I um, I keep buying these books. That some of the movies, especially the animated ones, or things like The Hobbit and so on as well, they come out with these books where they have, um, they have pages that are the whole scene. And I buy those books because they have some of the best composition some of the best lighting, some of the most yes. drama in yes. those books. And it was it, I actually that started because I went to a movie. I can't remember the name of it. it some sumo wrestler animation thing. I went with my kids. And uh-huh. the scenes in that movie were so well done. And when I saw this book, I had to have it. And then I started doing that ever since. I've got a Hobbit book. And you really can get a, a lot of a sense. And you, you, you study those and you can really see the the balance in their composition and the, you know, what really works. Yep. Pretty mm-hmm. cool. So this has been fascinating. I, um, I, I've really enjoyed our talk. When I always try to ask one of the big morbid questions and this one is really not necessarily about painting, but it can be. And that is that, um, all the work that you've ever done, all the paintings you've ever done have, somehow disappeared off the earth. There's no record of that. But um, you're on your deathbed. You have your friends and your family close around you, and you're able to impart three pieces of wisdom. They can be about life. They can be about painting. They can be about anything. What are those three pieces of wisdom you would impart? Wow. (laughs) Well, um, to love God and live your life, love your family, and to live your life the best you can and do unto others in the best way you can. Living is giving, baby. Yes, it is. Yeah, good answers. Well, this has been a pleasure. Anything else that we need to talk about before we sail off into the sunset? Well, I want to thank you so much, Mr. Eric Rhodes. It's been a, a, a pleasant talk with you, and thank you for inviting me. Oh, I'm, I'm honored to have you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Plein Air Convention. Maybe we can carve out some time. Not that there's much that keep me running, but maybe we can carve out some time and, and spend a little one-on-one. That'd be nice. Sure. Thank you, sir. All right. We'll see you soon. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, thanks again to Michael Godfrey. What a great guy. Sponsored by the Plein Air Convention held this April in San Diego with some of the most amazing artists in the world there to teach you 
Whether you're a beginner, just learning to paint, or an experienced pro, it is an amazing event. We go outdoors and paint together every day around beautiful San Diego. We have instruction indoors on four stages. We have a watercolor stage, a pastel stage, an oil stage, and one we call the demo stage. You can see every brush stroke because we've got cameras capturing it on big screens. And it is quite the experience, plus an expo hall filled with goodies. We keep you going from morning to night. Early morning art marketing boot camp. This year, I'm going to be showing you how to get at least a 33% increase in your business with almost doing nothing. Yep. And I've got a surprise guest by the name of Jay Abraham. The world's best marketing mind is going to visit us. It is a rare opportunity and a time you need to come to the Plein Air Convention. It's also sponsored by the Plein Air Salon Art Competition. Win $15,000 cash and the cover of Plein Air. There's lots of other cash prizes, including annual prizes and bi-monthly competition prizes. You'll be seen by top judges, and this is your last chance to enter. Enter at plenairsalon.com. Well, the Plein Air movement is red hot, and Plein Air magazine continues to soar at Barnes & Noble and other bookstores nationwide, so thank you for that. If you don't have it, drop by, pick one up, or get a bi-monthly subscription for about half the price of the newsstand at plenairmagazine.com. This is always fun. I love interviewing people, really get into the heart of them. So let's do this again sometime like next week. We'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. And remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Goodbye.